Honorable Mr. Justice Yuyu Lalit, born into a legacy, left a legacy when he demitted office as the Honorable Chief Justice of India on 8th of November 2022. His Lordship's remarkable innings in the field of law commenced with his enrollment in 1983 and continued through his practice in the High Courts of Bombay and Delhi and the Supreme Court where he was designated as the Senior Counsel in 2004. Trusted by the bench and bar, his Lordship was appointed as amicus curiae in many important matters. His Lordship was appointed as the Special Public Prosecutor for CBI to conduct trial in all 2G matters under the orders of the Supreme Court. His Lordship was appointed as the Judge of the Supreme Court in 2014 and as the Chief Justice of India on 27th of August 2022. An erudite judge, a gentle gentleman, compassionate to a cause, and committed to the learning of law. His Lordship continues his love for law by being a faculty in prominent law schools. May I now invite Honorable Mr. Justice Yuyu Lalit, former Chief Justice of India, to deliver lecture on the topic of the day. Honorable Justice Bechu Kurian Thomas, Senior Advocate Mr. Babu, Senior Advocate Mr. Menon, Mr. Biju, Learned Advocate. These are the office bearers who are concerned with the organization which has successfully been running this lecture series. The Honorable Justice Vinod Chandran and other honorable judges of the High Court, the senior advocates, junior advocates who are present in large number, ladies and gentlemen. 50 years since the celebrated judgment in Keshwanand Bharti was delivered by the Supreme Court. The gentleman came from this state, God's own country, and has given us great fulcrum on which the entire jurisprudence has since then developed. I also had the privilege to get associated with another milestone in environmental law, which is the in Godavarman, another gentleman coming from this state. These are celebrated cases which have nurtured and developed jurisprudential thinking. And one of the basic ideas which Justice Thomas dealt with just now is the takeaway from this judgment that says that the inherent limitation on the power of the, cons of the constituent power to amend the constitution, the power of the parliament to amend the constitution, is circumscribed by certain theories that you can amend everything but not the basic structure of the constitution, something which is considered to be so basic for the existence of not only the country, the communities, and even the individual. So these basic structures or the facets of basic structure comprise of various nuances, like the democratic principle that we have subscribed to, adult suffrage, one man, one vote, periodic intervention by the electorate to select the, their representatives, 
the socialist republic that the apparatus that we have devised for ourselves and among other things there is a concept such as independence of judiciary there are various articles which justice thomas mentioned just now which as a goal guide us in one direction and that is to have independent judiciary some of the democratic countries starting right from marbury versus madison they have always insisted that the power of the judicature to annul any instrument of law or executive action is a very sacrosanct power and that is something which is directly derivable from the basic document that that can constitution we have also been guided by that ethos those principles and therefore the structure of our constitution also incorporates various segments and specially the checks and balances but an issue had arisen and that is precisely why the entire supreme court had to set and consider the issue whether in its constituent power whether the parliament could amend any provision of the constitution or whether there can be read some inherent limitations within which that power has to be exercised and the celebrated judgments in keshwanand bharti which decided the matter 7 is to 6 by a very slender majority never has since then the full court of the supreme court ever sat except for one instance where perhaps i think 13 judges had again sat just to consider whether the matter requires to be reviewed or not but the matter was completely abandoned the largest bench since then was tma pi which was 11 judges what this judgment laid down though not in clear and precise terms on an ideological plane it was accepted that there are certain features of the constitution which are so inviolable and which are so important for the very existence of the democracy in the country and in order to help an individual to achieve the fullest of his potential that those principles cannot be frittered away cannot be amended cannot be modified or substituted by something else in today's discussion we will consider two facets of the matter because the moment we say judiciary it is the organizational structure the constitution or what constitutes what we normally call the superior judiciary so therefore the first part is the organization who constitutes the court how the judges are appointed how the judges then have to take their seats and what is the what is the paramount consideration the second part is of course the powers to be exercised by the judicature if it is accepted norm that we go by the idea of separation of powers and the basic job to interpret the constitution to interpret the laws and to give down a binding judgment which judgment must there guide the execution of everything in fact all your actions thereafter if that's the power that we give to the judicature the thinking has always developed that 
there must be complete independence so far as the functional issues are concerned and those functional issues normally get coined as what we normally say rule of law or the extent of powers whether those powers could be curtailed rule of law was specifically referred to as one of the basic features in the constitution by some of the judges who constituted the bench but our discussion is that how this ethos has since then developed and i will deal with just two or three cases on the point and then move on to the other segment the two articles which were incorporated one by perhaps 32nd amendment and the other by 42nd amendment one incorporated a provision in the constitution which enabled the state to come out with a law dealing with administrative tribunals in the state of andhra pradesh and one of the sub articles that is 243 d into bracket 3 and then into bracket 5 two sub articles dealt with one issue number 1 sub article 3 said that such a law made by the state may empower or may confer jurisdiction upon the tribunal which is exercisable or to be exercised by all the courts except the supreme court of india which is to say that apart from preserving the normal jurisdiction of the supreme court whether it is under 32 or 136 or any such thing so far as the other jurisdictional issues are concerned perhaps the power can be conferred upon the tribunals to be put in place by virtue of the power so given under this article sub article 3 sub article 5 said that the determination made by such tribunals shall be subject to confirmation by the executive proviso to that sub article 5 then empowered the state that such a law made by the state could as well give the power to the executive to substitute its own findings in place of the finding rendered by the tribunal that is to say that the power of the executive to modify the finding rendered by the tribunal this is what the amendment thought of why we are going into this issue because keshwanand bharti said that the power of the parliament to amend hereafter of course there is the other facet of the matter which is that coelo principle which i'll come to it later but the power of the parliament hereafter shall be subject to what is called inherent limitations which are basic features of the constitution and one of them was rule of law as laid down by the judgments on the point this amendment came into force sometime in 74 then in 76 42nd amendment came into force which inter alia incorporated one more article or rather two articles in the constitution again empowering the parliament to enact the law as a result of which or with the help of which central administrative tribunals could be put in place these tribunals now mark the difference or distinction in 32nd amendment the provision simply said 
that the law can confer upon the tribunals powers exercisable by courts other than the supreme court now the amendment now speaks of that the parliament can empower the tribunal to deal with of course everything which is supposed to be substitute for high court but it also said that the power the parliament can by law exclude the jurisdiction of courts other than the supreme court so mark the distinction or difference number 1 first of all in a very mild format to say that the provisions could empower the tribunal to exercise powers exercisable by courts other than the supreme court and now you go a step further and say very well such a law can exclude the power which was exercisable by courts other than the supreme court next article gave the power to the parliament to come out with tribunals dealing with various other issues in terms of which certain tribunals like central excise and gold appellate tribunal and so on and so forth could be established or in various states some of the tribunals dealing with tax matters were established now it so happened that the challenges to these amendments were heard by the same bench presided over by justice bhagwati who was then the chief justice by the time justice bhagwati had rendered a judgment in minerva mills which was the bench presided over by chief justice chandrachud and justice bhagwati's judgment is actually a minority judgment in which he inter alia said that of course rule of law is very sacrosanct but we cannot be misunderstood to say that the parliament is not empowered to put in place alternate or alternative institutional mechanism quote unquote this is the phrase which he uses in minerva mills when the challenge is raised to both these amendments 32nd and so far as this 42nd amendment the matter concerning the administrative tribunals including the challenge to the legislation which was brought in force as a result of that power was dealt with by the court first which is the celebrated judgment in sampat kumar in sampat kumar two judgments rendered one by justice bhagwati a concurring view and the principal judgment is by justice ranganath mishra who later became the chief justice of the court in that judgment the very same expression which was used by justice bhagwati in minerva mills that there can be alternative institutional mechanism it became the fulcrum for the judgment to say that very well high court's jurisdiction may have been taken away or excluded but equally efficacious jurisdiction has been conferred upon central administrative tribunals and therefore the parliament would be well within its competence to do so the challenge in sampat kumar was thus negated soon thereafter the challenge with regard to the other set of articles came up before the court and that is p samba murthy another judgment by a constitution bench of the supreme court relying on sampat kumar the bench in samba murthy which is a judgment authored by chief justice bhagwati again 
they reject the theory or the submission that there cannot be exclusion of jurisdiction. So they accept that theory. So therefore the challenge to sub-article 3 was negated. But so far as challenge to sub-article 5 was concerned, Justice Bhagwati says, it is unheard of that the determination by a tribunal which is supposed to be a substitute for the high court could be modified by the executive. He says this is shocking and this will be subversive of the principle of rule of law. So he put it on that quote unquote principle of rule of law that by separation of powers we have accepted a mechanism where adjudication is the function of the judicature or at best a substitute for that organ but how can the executive where the executive itself will be before the tribunal in the capacity as one of the parties to the dispute can be conferred upon the power to set at naught the determination made by the tribunal and therefore P. Sambamurti sub-article 5 was held to be invalid. These two judgments actually chart out a course as to what exactly can be the modality when you are having a substitute for the regularly exercisable power by the superior court including the high court. Very well then thereafter the issues came up, the doubts were expressed whether the central administrative tribunal could go into the constitutional validity of some of the rules enacted by virtue of power conferred under Article 309. Doubts were expressed whether the tribunal is competent or not competent. Some of the judgments rendered by the Supreme Court did say that yes, the tribunal must, the moment you accept in theory that it's a substitute for the High Court, then it must have the requisite power. Very well, that's the second stage. A judgment by AP High Court was a path-breaking judgment in this direction. That judgment, the division bench of the High Court said, among other things, number one, this fulcrum which was the basis of Sampat Kumar, that the parliament has the power to have an alternative institutional mechanism in place and thereby substitute a regular power exercisable by the High Court in a red jurisdiction under 226 has never been accepted by the Supreme Court. The genesis of that observation was in the minority judgment of Justice Bhagwati in Minerva Mills which has then been expounded to be the foundation for further theory. Number two, all through everything, all like judgments like Keshav Singh, judgment like Samshir Singh, judgments, judgments after judgment, it has always been accepted that the power of a writ court and the articles which are 226, 136, 32 and 227 are sacrosanct. And therefore, how could there be a substitute to the jurisdiction exercised under 226? It virtually said that the judgment under Sampat Kumar, in Sampat Kumar, was per incurium. That was the determination by division bench of AP High Court. Judgment authored by Justice M. N. Rao, who later became the Chief Justice of Himachal Pradesh High Court. A challenge came before the Supreme Court in L. Chandra Kumar. 
a bench of seven judges and judgment authored by Chief Justice Ahmadi. And he accepted what Division Bench of Andhra had done. He said that yes, there can't be complete exclusion. Such an exclusion of the power of constitutional court we don't subscribe to, we don't accept that. Judicial review, again, the fulcrum of the judgment is what? Judicial review by constitutional courts is the basic feature of the constitution. And therefore, even in its constituent power of amending the constitution, the parliament could not have put in place a machinery or an apparatus which would exclude the jurisdiction of the high courts. As a result of El Chandra Kumar, we are all aware as a legal fraternity that the determination made by the tribunal, which was hitherto before, could be challenged only in Supreme Court, is now assailable before the high court under its 226 jurisdiction because that 226 has to be preserved. Now, going by that standard, perhaps that sub article 3, which in Samba Murti the court relied upon Sampat Kumar as a student of law, in according to me, must also suffer the same consequences, and therefore, there cannot be a complete substitution for the power of the High Court. Why did I choose these judgments or these decisions? Because they go to the very root of... See, we are not getting into the questions of intent behind the legislature or any kind of effect of that legislation. We are going purely on the issue of power. What does our constitution contemplate? It contemplates a judicature which is to be at the apex level is the Supreme Court, at state levels are the high courts, they are supposed to be the constitutional courts which have been conferred upon the powers under 226. And that has always been construed and considered to be the basic feature of the constitution. Any attempt to eat into that or any attempt to modify that or to diminish the value or the extent of that power has not been accepted by the Supreme Court. So that's where we stand as a result of these three judgments on the point.